Welkom, welkom, goeie avond, welkom bij alweer de zevende AZ Night. De AZ Nights, dat zijn een serie Undisciplined Talks. Dat zijn meetups voor makers, denkers en studenten in de creatieve industrie. Wij hier allemaal, denk ik. Um, die hier geconfronteerd worden met verschillende sprekers, met een specifieke expertise of een bijzondere artistieke praktijk. En dat telkens rond een gekozen thema. En deze avond is het thema The Future of Work, de toekomst van werk. De vakantie is nu echt gedaan. Um, zoals je hebt gemerkt, ik spreek nu Nederlands. We gaan switchen vanavond tussen Nederlands en Engels. We hebben één talk vanavond in het Nederlands en twee in het Engels. Zijn hier eigenlijk mensen die Engels enkel... Are there people here who only speak English? Oké, okay, perfect. Kijk goed. Digitalisering, robotisering en ontwikkelingen op het gebied van artificiële intelligentie. Innovaties die ons dagelijks werkende leven ingrijpend kunnen veranderen en het waarschijnlijk al volop doen. En dan zijn er ook nog geopolitieke veranderingen en vrije marktprincipes waar we mee moeten rekening houden. Maar bij technologische innovaties op de werkvloer, denk ik vooral, kom gerust binnen, hier is nog plaats. Bij technologische innovaties op de werkvloer, denk ik in eerste instantie op robots die um, het werk van bijvoorbeeld fabrieksarbeiders in de auto-industrie um, gaan vervangen en 
En dat dan de, de arbeiders een hele andere taak krijgen. Maar het gaat niet over robots alleen vanavond. Wat met internet bijvoorbeeld, die onze manier van werken zo ingrijpend heeft veranderd. Of wat verandert voor ons... Uh, Kunstenaars, wat met onze artistieke praktijk gaan we die helemaal anders moeten aanpakken. En dan met die boom van freelance uh, werk gaan we dan meer moeten rekening houden met burn-outs die op de loer liggen. Als we eigenlijk altijd aan het werk zijn. En hoe gaan we eigenlijk met werk om? Um, wat doen wij met veranderingen in onze omgeving? Wat, en, en wat betekenen die, die veranderingen dan voor de kunstenaarspraktijk? Uh, ik ben Catharina Smet, ik ben de host van deze reeks EZ Nights. En um, ik ben radioproducer, ik ben zelf ook kunstenaar in radiowerk, in, in podcasts heet dat dan nu, in audio heet uh, ik maak ook installaties en voorstellingen. En ik, uh, ik doe een doctoraat in de kunsten over audioverhalen. Dus ik ben ook heel benieuwd uh, hoe vanavond zal verlopen. Maar voor we beginnen... Zoals elke keer beginnen we met een reeks vragen. Gewoon je hand opsteken als je ergens mee eens bent. Om te beginnen, voor wie is het de eerste keer op een EZ Night? Oké, okay, ja, toch meer dan de helft. Wie noemt zichzelf een harde werker? Wie vindt zichzelf eerder lui? Nee. Oké. Okay. Wie heeft er tijd voor hobby's? Oké, okay, genoeg, genoeg. Wie vindt het moeilijk om een onderscheid te maken tussen werk en vrije tijd? Oké, okay, ja, oké. Okay. Wie is een maker? Wie is een denker? Wie is een doer? Oh, kijk, ja. Wie denkt dat er minder banen zullen zijn in de toekomst? Ja, een paar. Wie denkt er bij de toekomst van werk aan het, bijvoorbeeld het utopische concept basic income of het basisinkomen? Oké, okay, toch een paar. Wie denkt dat robots uiteindelijk de wereld zullen overnemen? Ja, oké, okay. ja. okay, toch een paar. Um, wie zou er eigenlijk willen dat robots administratieve rompslomp zouden overnemen? De helft. En wie zou er niks op tegen hebben als um, robots bijvoorbeeld de content van je Instagram-account zouden bepalen of maken? Oké. Okay. En uh, wie denkt dat de artistieke praktijk zal veranderen door automatiseringsprocessen en robotisering? Oké, okay. kunst zal er anders uitzien. Wie denkt, ja, of hier, wie, wie werkt er ooit vanuit bed? Ja, oké. Okay. Voor wie is het onmogelijk om een tijd offline te gaan? Oké, okay. dat is toch wel positief. Wie gebruikt er eens een online platform om werk te krijgen, om bijvoorbeeld een freelance job te krijgen voor Fiverr, bijvoorbeeld. Drie mensen, vier mensen. En wie denkt dat in de toekomst werk samen zal gaan met burn-outs? En wie is er bang voor de toekomst? Toch een kleine helft. Ja, de vragen insinueren het al. Door technologische ontwikkelingen moet de betekenis van werk worden herdacht op artistiek, sociaal, filosofisch, economisch vlak. En vanavond spreken we met drie mensen. Met Ottonie van Reude, curator. Um, dat is een social designer, Ottonie. En curator en onderzoeker Katia Truijen. En dan theoretisch en artistiek onderzoeker en grafisch vormgever Silvio Lorusso. En ze zullen eigenlijk vanuit hun eigen ervaring en hun eigen onderzoek perspectieven en ideeën delen over de artistieke praktijk en hoe werk er in de toekomst, of misschien vandaag al, uitziet en zal uitzien. Ze zullen spreken over uitdagingen, onvermijdelijkheden misschien en mogelijkheden. En alle drie zijn ze gevraagd om hun talk te baseren op het getal vijf. Dus bijvoorbeeld vijf perspectieven, meningen, frameworks of claims misschien die dan gaan dienen voor het kader van hun talk. En aan het eind van het programma is er ook een gesprek met alle drie samen. En daar zit Wiede Verknokken, voor wie hem nog niet kent. Wiede is illustrator. <laughs> en uh, hij zal tekenen bij wat hij hier hoort. Um, Wiede, een, een kleine vraag. Ja. <laughs> Denk jij op voorhand al na, of laat je je echt inspireren door het moment zelf? Ik uh, probeer zo weinig mogelijk aan de toekomst te denken, eigenlijk. Dat is heel goed. 
Goed, laat ons beginnen. We eindigen vanavond om tien uur. En uh, voilà, heel benieuwd wat de toekomst brengt. Ottonie. Ottonie van Rudde is uh, een social designer. En dat betekent dat ze niet alleen stilstaat bij de impact van automatisering voor het leven in het algemeen, maar dat ze zich ook afvraagt wat het cultureel kan betekenen. En dat het ook wat, ja, wat betekent het eigenlijk binnen haar eigen artistieke praktijk. Ottonie studeerde in 2017 af aan de Design Academy in Eindhoven met het project Post Laboratory, wat ik een hele slimme naam vind, en waarmee ze ook genomineerd werd voor de Gijs Bakker Award. En er zat een robotje op scène, voor wie het nog niet heeft herkend. En daar gaat het onder andere over. Sinds haar afstuderen heeft zij het project haar Post Laboratory verder ontwikkeld. En ze wil het ook op haar persoonlijke werksituatie betrekken. En benieuwd hoe ver dat dat gaat. En dan nu, over naar het Engels, Ottoni. Hello, I am O O O O O O O O S I A, and today I would like to take you on an adventure from labor to work. Robot technologies are becoming part of our daily lives and are changing our working environments substantially. Robots are progressively performing jobs previously conducted by humans. According to researchers, 47 up to 80% of current jobs are likely to be automatable within the next 20 years. In the past technological development created new industries and therefore new kinds of jobs. But the current wave of automation is running is so fast that most of us will not be able to keep up with the necessary skills. If our prevailing systems remain unchanged, we will be facing a social crisis. Precariousness will increase and an undesirable dystopia could become a reality, an economy in which all automating technology is owned and operated by 1% of the population, while the remaining 99% would either be unemployed or could do the leftovers of non-automatable labor. Instead of seeing the automation of labor as a threat, I suggest to embrace it as an opportunity to renegotiate the value of labor and work. Let's liberate ourselves from the necessity of labor in order to prevent a dystopian future. Ideally, automation and a new social system will allow us to spend more time with the things we really enjoy. What if a robot could do your job? What would you do if you wouldn't have to work anymore? Since I'm not working for the personnel anymore, I have more time for other nice things. I go walking with the dogs and lonely old people in the neighborhood. In the beginning, it was difficult to liberate myself after many years of working. Uh, but now it gives me a good feeling to really do something non-commercial for the society. In the 1980s, the philosopher Frithjof Bergman introduced the six months, six months proposal to counter the loss of 50% of the jobs in the automotive industry, which was due to automation. He suggested that the workers work half of the year and spend the other half with more exciting things. The workers refused the proposal not knowing what to do with the freedom in prospect. <coughs> Bergman described this as a poverty of desire, a societal ill that people do not know what to do when asked regarding true calling. The labor we do is such a vital source of status and identity that it is tough for us to face a mental liberation from employment. Such a proposal implies a significant cultural shift and questions how we would exist without labor. The philosopher Hannah Arendt distinguishes between work and labor. Labor on the one hand is a cyclical, repeated and partly futile process. Labor is the main way we acquire an income, performed mainly out of necessity. Work on the other hand is the defining activity of humanity. Work includes the opportunity for creativity, collaboration and satisfaction. I propose to use the automation of labor for a transition from labor to work. 
from an activity we perform out of economical necessity towards an activity we perform out of our intrinsic motivation. still painting, but at this time I can do the painting jobs that I love. I have more time to relax, to do my hobbies, to spend some more time with my family. When we started the project, I was a little bit skeptic. If a robot can do a painter job, as we get along the process of developing and teaching the robot, I, I got really enthusiastic. Technological progress alone will not bring about the post-labor future. We also need to set the right social and political conditions. One example could be the universal basic income. The idea is that there would be a steady income unconditionally provided to every member of society. It would be enough to cover basic needs and allow everyone to subsist without a job. The universal basic income offers an attractive potential economic solution for a post-labor society. But the biggest difficulties might be cultural as wage labor is so profoundly embedded in our identity. We have to unlearn labor in order to prepare for a post-labor future. How would humanity transform if leisure becomes a fundamental right of humankind rather than an ancient privilege of the elite? I am imagining a future in which we live together with self-developed robots that perform labor in order to let us follow our passion. I am introducing a public service that lets us participate in the abolition of our own labor in order to let us explore a post-labor future. The post-labor tree is an answer to the rapid automation of labor and the resulting cultural crisis. It liberates us from the idea of the necessity of labor and supports us in discovering our true desires. It offers participants the possibility to abolish their job by developing a robot that does their labor with the engineering help of post-labor companions. For the documentation of human skills, knowledge, tools and experiences the working process of each participant is recorded this documentation feeds the development of the robots but is also stored in the database of the post-laboratory. Through the abolition of their labor, the participants can explore a post-labor future. The post-labor companions assist the participants to reconsider their desires during individual sessions. The creative action of making and discussions about work, leisure and life enables this passage. The post laboratory claims that the quality of automating technology increases if the specialists, people working in the job to be automated, take an active part in the development of the robot. During the development process the robot becomes the apprentice of the participant. The post laboratory combines the skills of the participants and the post labor companions that include design, engineering and social sciences. The post-laboratory supports the transition of workers into non-workers and the building of a post-labor future. I'm in Morocco this moment. I started uh, to travel around. Right now we are in uh, Taos. That's uh, where many Bedouin uh, people are living. We learned to, how to make, how to weave carpets. And yes, that's, that's what I'm doing now. It, it was so strange that I just didn't have to work anymore. Without a job, without the need to earn money. We talked a lot about it eh, at that time, when we were making this robot. That was really helpful for me. About your free time, what, what is nice to do in your free time. Now I would like to invite all of you to join the post laboratory to free yourselves. At this moment we still have to create the needed societal and political framework to realize a post labor future. We must start discussing the obsolescence of labor and support the progress of automation technology as a societal project. Liberate from labor, free to work. Yes, so now I would like to interrupt. <laughs>
because I would like to talk more about my personal perspective on the project. Um, one year after finishing the first part that you just saw and also involving some reflections. So in order to continue, the, so this was, um, yeah, it wasn't said before in the presentation that this was, this was part of my graduation project during my master's studies at the Design Academy in Eindhoven. Um, so in order to continue this project, I, my first aim was actually to widen the discussion or to, yeah, to gather a bigger audience. So one way to do so in the last year was to find different institutions that are already working on the same research topic and that are interested in collaborating with me and bringing this discussion further. So one example I'm showing now is something I did last week in, at the Design Week in Vienna together with the Institute of Design Research that they're already researching on the future of work since three years. And we um, built up a pop-up office, or no, I don't like the word pop-up, but a temporary office um, where people that are passing by, visitors, could yeah, either by passing by or apply for consultation sessions. So the both of us that you also see on the picture, we were sitting there and, and offering um, a discussion with people about their current job or labor, what they perceive as labor, how they could imagine the automation of their labor and how their life would change or how this life, post-labor life, could look like. So we broke down actually already what I did in the with the three people that where you saw the videos before where we made the prototypes together it was already shrinking process because usually the automation I mean you can all think of your own labor it will be a process of several years to automate it and I broke it down to a prototype and a few weeks so what we did last week was breaking it down to half an hour or one hour conversation. So it was very much only conceptually thinking about it and just discussing, so very dry. And we broke down this, this process of which would happen in the speculative office um, to mainly five questions. So maybe I will tell you about the questions and then you can all keep them in your mind, think a little bit about it and also when you get back home tonight, <laughs> discuss with your housemates or your friends. So the first is starting with what do you do? So what do you do is a question that we always ask in the beginning of every small talk conversation, which shows also how embedded our current working culture is in each of us and how we identify ourselves with the job we do or if you're a student with what you study, which is also can also be perceived as labor. The second question is what do you like to do in your free time? The third question is what if a robot could do your job and how would the automation of your labor look like? The fourth question is what would you teach the robot? So it's very important what was said already before that robots, I mean robots, we, I mean for me it's more a metaphor for new technology. So what that this new technology are, is our apprentice. And the last question is what would you do if you did not have to work anymore? So in order also to automate this process of discussion, I worked with an um, organization called Mein Grundeinkommen. They're based in Berlin and promoting the universal basic income. And we developed, it's still in the, still in the testing or development phase, um, a chatbot that actually has this discussion with you. So you're sitting in a cabin and um, chatting with a um, computer voice and it works over Google AI. So um, depending on how you answer, the next question will be asked or the conversation will go in a different way. Um, and our next aim to make it also accessible to, to a wider audience would be to have it online, on a, um, not on a speech-based conversation, but on a text-based conversation. 
And to continue also on a very small scale what I did in the three first projects and to test it in different geographical contexts, cultural contexts, and um, also to visualize the concept better because I also feel like that the robots um, visualize the, the idea of the office in a different way than, for example, a temporary office where you have conversations. So therefore, um, during an exhibition in Detroit, um, this springtime, I build a, and also, yeah, I would say, I build a um, robot together with one of the curators of the exhibition. He's a photographer and composer. So with this, I also wanted to engage different kinds of labor because in the first three projects, out of my personal interest, intuition, time, I, I worked with people mainly performing manual labor. So this time I also wanted to kind of widen the, yeah, the frame and uh, wanted to include someone who was performing creative labor. So we developed together a photography robot and he is still working on a music piece um, for, to accompany this robot. And the robot is, um, or was, the exhibition is already over, was taking pictures in the same style as he usually would take pictures of the people passing by the exhibition space, which you can see on the, for you it's on the right. And then for the design biennial in Istanbul, which is also um, still taking place, I um, developed a tea making robot. The idea was to collaborate with a tea maker in Istanbul. And there I concentrated so there it was, I wanted to talk about also social labor, so because the tea makers in Istanbul, they, um, the, ro the role they have is not only just the tool to, for the social labor, so they're listening to people's stories, they're the safety guards of the street and of the entrance of the house. Um, they are also, if something is broken in your apartment, they would come to help you fixing it. Um, yeah, and this was for me important to include also in the design of the robot. And what was in both projects um, very... Ah, okay. um, yeah, the collaboration part was quite tricky because in both projects I was only visiting the places. And I realized that like for such a collaboration you need much more time and much more trust. And that was kind of a challenging part, um, doing these kind of projects in a new place. So one of my next aims is not, uh, yeah, not only to talk about the project I did already, but actually to bring it content-wise one step further. So I would like to concentrate more on creative labor or the design field. And one in different aspects. So one thing I would, yeah, I would like to do it in the framework of a longer research project and do a field research on how labor is perceived in the design world. Then um, I would like to work on the automation of my own labor in different experiments. And um, I also would like to study how, what the technological possibilities are and how um, our skills such as creativity actually work psychologically but also neuroscientific and if a software can be creative or if there are different kind of kinds of creativity. And one main struggle I would like to share with you <laughs> is that still with all these approaches of uh, widening the audience and bringing this topic outside of the design field, I still feel that it's very speculative and very much staying in the design bubble, in the way it's framed, in the way the whole idea is communicated. And um, in the last months, I, yeah, I was questioning a lot how this discussion, which is so important to all of us um, currently, or, or will be also, um, yeah, how, how we can extend this and how this can be brought um, 
more to everyday life, but at the same time not losing its quality, not losing the speculative charm. And um, yeah, I have few ideas in mind, but um, I'm also curious about um, your ideas or your criticism. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. You can take your mic with you, and then uh, I have a few questions, Olga. Okay. Yeah, maybe you can stand a little bit closer, because otherwise we're so far apart. Um, why did you choose to use a robot voice in the beginning of your talk? It was uh, to make it like very obvious that also the presentation can be automated, like yeah. to be like to automate until the end, but then in the second part, I wanted to do it in an automated way, and then I put the text, like my own reflection, um, into the text-to-speech um, platform, and it was very, yeah, very um, irritating. To <laughs> and why, to and at what point do you think it became irritating? Was it because there is, for example, when you talk about the tea maker, you say, yeah, it was a little bit difficult, perhaps, to win trust. Is it the moment where emotions come in, or what is a what is a moment where you think you can't use a disembodied voice? I think it was about the reflection. So when it's not only about summarizing my research, and um, because I think the first part was more like a book or something. Yeah, something you could also read as a text, and the second part is more something that you would tell someone in a conversation. Yes. And yeah. I wouldn't write down in, in that way. Yeah. So, an interesting thing is that you talk to several people in um, when you are creating the robots in the, of, in the laboratory office. Um, what do you remember from these conversations? Were there things that surprised you when you, for example, asked was it Veronique who made uh, the, the cleaning robot? Um, how did they, these conversations go? And I think the um, most interesting part for me was that all the three of them and also the tea maker in Istanbul, it was not about the photographer, but that they were all very much against um, my concept. Like really? They, they were more refusing, but there, it was a mixture of refusing and curiosity, because otherwise they wouldn't have spent time with me. And that over the process, I could really feel that the discussion got more um, fruitful over the making of the robot. So as more of the robot was visible or was working, as more they could actually imagine to question what they're doing currently. And that was very interesting for me because um, that's something I thought of before, but I wasn't so sure that it will actually work. Mm -hmm. And the second thing that I found very, very interesting was that I realized that it's less about the activity, the division between labor and work, but it's more about the context and the conditions. So for example, all of them, when they talked about their post-labor life, the same kind of activities came up again, but in a different context. So for example, the um, post-deliverer, she, st she still would like to do the same activity, like walking around the neighborhood, but she would not do it for the post-NL, she would do it for people with dogs and for old people. So it's she's not changing the activity, but she's questioning the purpose of it. And the same with uh, Veronique, she, she, she was talking, I mean, it's not, you can't say this is very scientific or this is very deep research because it's very qualitative, like, um, but she was talking about traveling, exploring, learning, but the cleaning also always came up in a different way. Really? Yeah. How so? Yeah, like, um, for example, cleaning, um, she was talking about living on a farm and then she would clean the shed <laughs> and but yeah and also yeah. for her I, I think cleaning in itself is not a unjoyful unenjoyable activity it's really about for whom you work with whom how many hours per week why do you why are you doing it 
so it's all about the conditions I think uh, I just know it from myself when I wash my dishes at home I I <laughs> I don't do it because I don't like to do it. But when I'm at a friend's home, I really don't care. Yes. Like then I do it out of like because I would like to help the person. It's maybe interesting because the automated <coughs> voice also spoke of the mental liberation and the difficulty of mental liberation of work. But maybe it was a more um, negative way of seeing uh, work then, or maybe or or because if you say like the ex people like the action, but actually other things are in, uh, are in play here? Or how do I have to read this difficulty of yeah, mental liberation of uh, work? Do you know what I mean? I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I, what struck me is in, in that actually people said that they, uh, that the mental liberation, like <coughs> distancing yourself from labor is actually quite difficult. And I was wondering, did you experience that as well? Or is it like you said, actually, people like working, but there are other factors uh, playing? Yeah, and I think this makes it also diff This is one factor why it is difficult. Also, I get a lot of negative reactions. When Also now, when we had the temporary office last week, we got like a lot of negative reactions. Why? Because people... Yeah, mainly people feel offended when they see this. They feel offended about their own job and that it's not... A lot of questions people ask were about... Um, they always ask, what about the human val the value of human work? Mm -hmm. And um, it's very hard, I think, to understand the, the distinction that it's not about the activity you do, but um, about the, yeah, what I said before, about the yes. conditions. Another thing that, for example, the photographer robot that we saw standing in Detroit, um, would you describe that art that he's making? Accidental artist? Or is he actually performing the function of a photographer? Yeah, so in this case it's, um, it's also a prototype, so um, it's a suggestion how photography robot could work like all the other ones I mean this one is also not cleaning my house <laughs> um, yeah so I hope for you so maybe the question is more if if the robot would actually work if then he would produce art I would say yes but I think the prototype is just an image he's I like the the, mm -hmm. the machine is just an image for an idea yes yeah Anthony, thank you very much. I thank you. Take a seat and we will go to, or is there a question maybe for Anthony? There will be time for questions in our final talk as well, in our final discussion. Thank you, Anthony. Wieder. Mogen we eens kijken wat je hebt gemaakt? Yes, absoluut. Um, so, uh, this is a guy, it's all about post labor. Somebody is all about post truth. <laughs> That's what I did. This would be convenient today for me. <laughs> I like the, the tea making robot out of control. The, the small talk robot, I would like it too. Who does the small talk for you? And sit and stare. Uh, robots who build robots so they can have more leisure time. <laughs> Netflix and chill is also important for robots. And I think this guy is feeling a burnout coming. So, a great robot. Yeah, this wasn't ready, so. <laughs> Thank you very much, Vida. Thank you. I would also like a round of applause for this beautiful thing right here. Yes. Thank you.